Stolberg. You were just saying in, in chat a minute ago that you couldn't quite remember exactly when you were recruited into the South African Communist Party, but I'm sure you can remember how you were recruited. I mean, how was that approach made to you? Quite simply, you've been very active for a long time. Uh, we think we know your politics. Would you like to join? Uh, you must think about it because it's all illegal and so on. And I said, I've thought about it, yes. Um, uh, because I thought it was important. There was the need to ensure that within the campaigns for national liberation, that the specific role of working people, of landless people, of a peasantry, if there is one in South Africa, uh, unemployed, be not forgotten. And it needs a political party to do that, particularly where a national movement by definition includes people of all social strata and classes. Can we get some approximate fix on the date? We're talking about what, the 1950s? Oh, sometime after 1956 and uh, the um, not so secret speech of Khrushchev to the 20th Congress of the CP of the Soviet Union. Um, because that came as um, a very good revelation of, um, of some of the things that can go wrong and of the need to avoid those kinds of mistakes. Uh, it was a very exciting time. I preceded you by about a year. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> who was it who made the approach? I mean, not necessarily the name, but what sort of person? Oh, it was Brian Bunting, uh, who was on the Central Committee. Uh, that's an assumption because we didn't talk about things like that. Uh, he was certainly on the district committee of the, uh, in Cape Town. You were joining a party which, as you say, was vilified by the authorities, which was uh, underground, strictly legal, clandestine, necessarily secretive. What sort of nature was, what was party work? What was being a party member like? Um, reading, discussing, trying to get to grips with Marxist theory and its relevance to South Africa, that it was clearly no use simply talking about the um, ser series of slavery, feudalism, uh, merchant capitalism, capitalism, monopoly capitalism, as in Europe. There were many similarities, but South Africa was a colony uh, into which a capitalist um, component had really flowered with the discovery of diamonds in 1860. And the need was to understand the way in which apartheid, racial segregation, fitted with that colonial system. How important was it to a party member at that stage, their, their party membership? How much did it take over your life? How much energy did it involve? How much commitment? Well, you see, most of our ordinary political work was done in the mass organizations. I was a member of a, what we then called a multiracial youth organization. Um, we would now call it non-racial. And Congress of Democrats, which was part of the Congress Alliance led by the ANC. Um, so that's where our ordinary day-to-day -day political work was done. If you say, how much of my life did it take over? Well, I had a job, and I had ordinary open legal political work, and I suppose I had one or two nights a week at home, occasionally. It was a very, um, a very exciting and vibrant time of really resistance to the growth of apartheid as against what had been called segregation, in which um, laws were enacted to close the gaps in the practices of segregation and the existing laws, and in fact taking away rights which black South Africans had had. So it was really a time of defense rather than uh, of attack to overthrow the state. But in that time, for instance, and I came into it just after the defiance of unjust laws campaign, uh, there was already a vision of what a 
knew South Africa might be. And the first campaign I was really involved in, one of any size, was the call to the Congress of the People, which ratified the Freedom Charter. Uh, I lost my job on the South African Railways because I addressed a meeting, and if you're a government servant, you can't be involved in politics. I was lucky I got 30 days' notice. They could have fired me in 24 hours. Um, but that was thrilling. Clandestinity, it meant you had to keep the document secret. It means you had difficulty printing documents. I mean, what sort of difficulties were simply organisational difficulties? Because it's difficult to, for people to imagine quite what it means to I work in a clandestine lucky. party. I was lucky. I used to keep documents in a leather bag in my neighbour's hedge. The hedge was his side of the fence. And years later, I met him and he said... Uh, he remembered me popping the bag on his side of the fence. Um, but uh, there were always places in houses, in gardens, and so on, and the security police would have had to have been very determined uh, to find every single document. Uh, sometimes people were caught with documents. Uh, sometimes they were charged, sometimes they weren't. But what I did notice, even in the Ravonia trial, in which I was tried later in '63 was the number of state witnesses, people who had been broken under torture and interrogation, who would talk anything and everything about the ANC, but would not talk about their party membership, even, they were no, even though they were known by some of us to be party members. There was a kind of deeper loyalty that you just didn't talk about. Um, I think we were sort of brought up on the struggles in Europe of the underground in uh, the Maquis in France, of the, what did they call it, the Red Orchestra in Germany. Uh, and in fact, our time was less difficult than they had under the Nazi occupation. But there was a kind of romanticized heroism uh, that went with it. But also found that amongst white comrades, there was a much greater reluctance to reveal openly one's um, uh, affiliation. But African comrades would speak out at meetings and I would be still trying to formulate how I was going to put a point of view which had been documented and circulated and to put it in a way which didn't reveal that I'd read the document. And I would just get up and state what was in the document and so what? Uh, it, was, uh, it was a lovely eye-opener of absolute determination. But also what I found was, uh, despite all the vilification, especially now, was the way in which particularly black working people in South Africa moved in their political work between the Communist Party, between the African National Congress and their trade union work. They had no theoretical problems about it. It simply suited to do some work one way and some the other. Um, and they sort of floated between them. They had different objectives. Some coincided in the short term, some in the longer term. Totally at ease, totally happy with it. Difficult to measure, but it's a rather important question. Mm. How big, how influential was the SACP in the late 50s? I think that it was... Um, it's not so much a case of influential... It's a case of the absolute steadfastness of that organization uh, after its re-foundation, I think in 53, building up an underground clandestine network. It was able to function under tremendous pressures and survive, maintain its communications, but in particular the uh, minor strike of 1946 in which Communist Party members had had a tremendous influence. It was before it was declared illegal. Um, and the trial of the Central Committee on charges of sedition for that minor strike helped to cement a, a relationship which had existed between the Communist Party and the ANC in an up and down way over many years. Then, with the Afrikaner Nationalist Government uh, enacting the Suppression of Communism Act and the shooting down of 
marchers in 1950 who were protesting that act. It, it, it came into effect on May the 8th, 1950, I think. Um, somewhere around there. But on May Day, 1950, there was a march in protest against the uh, Suppression of Communism Act. Workers were shot down. And the ANC then mounted an even larger protest on June 26th in protest against the shootings and the act, which was clearly aimed at any opposition to apartheid, whether you were a communist or not. Uh, and for instance, communism was defined as the advocacy of any system other than the one that uh, ruled. That was communism. Uh, and they saw correctly that the Suppression of Communism Act was actually aimed in the main at the ANC because the South African Communist Party membership was small. But there had always been people like Moses Katani, who was Secretary General of the Communist Party, who was on the National Executive of the ANC and accepted as operating within the disciplines of each organization depending on where he was. He didn't push his party line when he was in the ANC, he was bound by that organization's policies and disciplines. He didn't say, no, he wouldn't accept this because he doesn't agree with something else. Uh, and in that sense, he was tremendously influential. But you joined the SACP with alacrity when you were offered the chance. You must have been aware of the nature of the work of the SACP. You must have had some idea of the importance or role of the party you must have had some idea of a Leninist model of a party. How did you gather that when the party was illegal? Oh, I grew up with that. Uh, and in fact, uh, my parents had both been active in the Communist Party. My problem was that when I went to university in 1950, um, very young, I was 16 when I started off, I knew what it meant to be a communist. My problem was whether I was going to be politically active or not. It took me four years to the end of my time at university to work out that I couldn't simply stand aside. Things were getting worse and I knew about them. And um, it was hard to accept the privileges of being a white South African. Having grown up with a point of view my problem was, did I accept that point of view because I'd taken it in with my mother's milk or because I had a commitment? Uh, it took me four years to work out that I had a commitment of my own. Uh, and then when you were in the party, there was the decision after, what, a few years of your membership to go for armed struggle. Can you remember or give me some idea of the nature of the debate within the party in particular about launching MK? Well, I can only tell you about uh, what I know from my little unit in Cape Town. Um, I know that I'd been arguing for at least a year on my own within my group of the need for this and ways in which it could be done. I still believe I was right about that. Uh, and um, the argument was whether the state whether the, the state would simply crush any such movement and everything else with it, whether in fact we could possibly mount sufficient force to have any effect and in what way it should be done. But what was interesting was the impatience of... You were talking about the decision to, to yeah. launch MK. Um, I can remember with the stay at home in 1960, uh, which was crushed by the armed. You're talking about 1960. Um, the crushing of the stay at home in 1960. Um, what was that one about the 1960 stay at home? That wasn't that uh, shock. Oh, it was Sharpville, of course, um, where the thousands of us were simply arrested. We spent four months or five months in prison, detained. And an awful lot of talking took place in every prison 
about how we go forward from there. Because if ordinary political activity leads to shootings on the scale of Sharpeville, and the growing repression, should we continue to turn the other cheek? This was followed by 1961 and that South Africa having been forced out of the Commonwealth over its racial policies, uh, the referendum in South Africa amongst whites only, of course, uh, to have a republican form of state uh, a long-held dream of the Boers, uh, the glory of the old republics. Um, that referendum was to be held. For us, it didn't matter whether we had a republic or we had the Queen of England as the head of state. It was irrelevant to us. What we did care about was that the draft constitution actually included the exclusion of black South Africans from any of the political structures of the state, whereas the previous constitution didn't, uh, although that was the practice. Um, so a stay-at-home was called, a stay-at-home being a general strike, but it's illegal for black workers to go on strike, so therefore they stayed at home. Um, and this too was largely suppressed by the armed forces of the state aircraft, helicopters, armoured vehicles, patrolling townships at night and so on. Some areas good success, elsewhere not so good. And at that point, I think amongst um, younger people uh, in the organs of the Congress Alliance, ANC, Indian Congress, Coloured People's Congress and Congress of Democrats, there was a, a pretty rapid acceptance of the idea of armed struggle. Among some of the older, more conservative members of the ANC, there was a great deal of resistance. It's not right, um, and so on. Um, during the 1961 stay-at-home, I got caught up in a, an odd situation where I heard of people who were going to place petrol bombs in bus depots. Because if you're going to have a strike, if the buses aren't running, then the strike will be a success. But our policy was non-violence. But I happened to agree with them. Well, I managed to dig out the executives who had gone into hiding, as we always had to do when such campaigns were called, and raised the issue, and it was agreed that they would be stopped, and they were stopped. I stopped by the party? There were party members, and it was actually cut at People's Congress. Uh, but there was a lot of interlocking memberships uh, around. But these were members of Coloured People's Congress, you see. And um, do you maintain discipline even when you think what's being done is right and the policy is wrong? Uh, I believe you maintain discipline because individuals don't achieve much on their own. It's done collectively. Uh, on balance, I think I was right. But once the um, uh, armed struggle uh, was undertaken, I was approached because I was a civil engineer and I had technical skills which were in short supply. Ronnie had similar sorts of skills. Um, would I join? And uh, I was told to think about it and said, yes, I'll think about it. Yes, of course I'll join. This, this is joining on Conte with Israel. Yes. Um, but I must tell you, the bombs I made for December 16th didn't go off. One was planted. The guy who planted it was caught in the planting. That was George Peake. Planted a bomb. It was um, a propaganda thing at the back door of a prison in Cape Town. But he'd been betrayed and uh, was found with the bomb in his hands as he was planting it. A circle of police waiting for him. And I'm quite relieved that it went off 24 hours later, uh, not on time, with the detonator in a policeman's hand. That was very nice. Um, I've never talked about this before. What exactly was your role then? You've been credited in the press with being a sabotage expert. Well, it's very flattering, but I was... Um, they called it logistics. In other words, I was the weapons maker. When the 90-day um, detention law was about to come into effect, I was then faced with a problem. 
because I was known as the technical guy in Cape Town. Everything from silk screening and printing and whatever had to be done, I did. Um, and I would have been arrested straight away. That was the view. And even if I were not broken, others would break, because that's the nature of interrogation. Um, and I would probably spend ten years inside, with a minimum of five years in the sentencing, you see. And um, it was agreed that I should pass through Johannesburg and arrange with the uh, high command of Mkonto is where my going. Because you didn't just leave. Uh, but it was agreed that I should go abroad and get more training and got to Johannesburg. I was asked to stay and to report on the prospects of making the weapons of war for an underground army. And I set about that project. Sadly, we got arrested six weeks later. Uh, pity, because I never did get to make weapons on a large scale. My regret is that we got caught. Not that we didn't intensify our armed struggle based on our own internal resources. How high up were you in the MK and the SACP at the time you were arrested? In the SACP, I was a member, and in Conto is where I was on the logistics committee of the High Command. Um, I denied it vociferously in court. Actually, they didn't think to ask me that question because they had no evidence about it, so they didn't know to ask, so I didn't have to say it. What were you doing at Rivonia? At Rivonia, uh, my task was to continue with the planning for making weapons on a large scale, uh, like 210,000 hand grenades and uh, you know, 48,000 landmines. The figures are burnt in my memory and all the explosives and the detonators and the timers and what have you. We would have had to have set up an industrial production line somewhere to make the stuff quick enough. Where were you going to get your help from? I mean, had you any clear idea in your own mind, and was this going to be effectively with the help of the Soviet bloc countries? No, the, the whole point about this was that we were going to make and rely upon our own weapons internally. Um, and guerrilla forces have to do that. They have to make their own and take their own from the state forces. If they don't, they become more like standing armies and less flexible, um, less able to deal with the untoward. Uh, we had a strategy at the time of sabotage acts which would stretch the security forces of the state. And it's a simple guerrilla dictum you attack where the enemy is weak and you retreat where they are strong. But eventually you get to the point where having carried out acts of sabotage, you would wait for them and ambush them because you would be strong and the initial patrol would be weak. Now obviously this was going to cost lives, but they would be military lives or police lives. It's equal to military in South Africa. Um, Whatever it did, it would make the cost of apartheid so high, uh, which is it's based on cheap labor, low wages. But if you've got to pay taxes for uh, increased security forces, prisons, this, that, and the other, eventually the burden on the economy becomes too great. That's actually happened. It didn't go precisely as we thought because our underground uh, army was crushed. They were arrested at Ravonia and thereafter actually smashed us for a long time. And the army was then built externally in Angola, in Mozambique, other countries of Africa. Um, and that made it very difficult because there was a lot of infiltration by security agents. Now, I was in prison at this time. This is recapping. Uh, and maybe you should talk to Ronnie about this period because he knows about it better than I do. But the intention, I don't think we ever really believed we could take on the armed forces of the state and beat them in battle. South Africa is a highly industrialized state. Uh, they can put police and troops anywhere they like within about 20 minutes of uh, a need to do so. What we had to do was make the political cost of suppressing that war of liberation too high. 
and that means the economic cost. I think we envisaged that at the time. Talking about Rivonia, mm. I mean, it must have been a terrible moment when you realized that, uh, well, that you're going to be arrested. I mean, can you remember what was happening when whatever happened at Rivonia happened? You mean what I was doing, what you know, was going on? Personal circumstances, whereabouts were you in, 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 in the house, I was what in, were you doing? I was in the lounge reading Robert Young's Brighter Than a Thousand Suns about the dropping of the bombs on the nuclear bombs on Hiroshima. Um, it was a very cold day, but by Christ it was cold when those cops bust in the doors. They just came slamming through French doors and windows and what have you. There was a meeting going on in the outhouses of the High Command itself. Um, the High Command of? Um, on Conto. And uh, I was on the Logistics Committee, not on the High Command, but, you know, the top group. Um, and God, that day got cold. Yeah, it was very cold. And I remember getting up and grabbing my jacket and going for the toilet because I had notes in my pocket. Um, but they'd come in through all the doors at once. I couldn't get there. Uh, it's quite a bewildering moment. And um, I've had raids at home many times. And no matter how many times they knocked on the door at three in the morning and uh, I would ask for their warrant, very formal, very precise and proper. I couldn't read the damn thing because the adrenaline was pumping and my knees were wobbling. And, uh, but I would read it and take my time, you know. Uh, and the same thing happened again. You kind of, I suspect, go quite pale and you clench your teeth. And you hold yourself up because you can't let them beat you. You can't let them have that moral victory of seeming to think they've crushed you. But at Rivonia they netted rather big fish. Oh, well, uh, there was uh, Walter Sisulu and Goblin and Becky and uh, who else was there? Ray Rusty Bernstein, who got off. God, how he got off, I don't know. <laughs> he won't like it if I say, there ain't no justice. He got off and I got four life sentences. <laughs> it's an inversion of the usual way of talking about there isn't any justice. Um, there's always been some confusion about whether Walter Sisulu was ever a member of the SACP, was he? I don't know. I didn't ask questions like that. If I didn't work with him in the organization, I didn't ask. And um, the same with others. Um, so, so you were never quite sure who your party comrades were? That's correct. That's absolutely right. And it was designed that way. You just didn't know. I'll tell you some little stories about it. Um, uh, and I self-consciously avoided asking. Um, I could judge political attitudes, and I've said... Not knowing who your comrades were. It was a matter of principle that in an organization where you operated in little units, some people call themselves, but in little units you knew your comrades and you knew your contact person who would be your contact with a regional committee or district committee and that would have contact higher up the scale it was actually a matter of honor not to ask they were always inquisitive buggers who would break the rules because uh, they had to know but in fact I've never judged people by what they've said they were uh, it's what they say it, of not what they call themselves but what they say the way they analyze situations how they see a way forward and what they do, that's what matters. Um, I've found it's quite a good basis. During your 22 years in prison, mm. was the SACP able to organize, discuss in any form inside prison? Well, there were some of us uh, there who, whom we knew to be communists, and it was very nice because by that time all of us were prescribed, banned, we couldn't attend meetings. Technically, we shouldn't have been able to speak to each other because we were prohibited from talking to any banned person. We had meetings every day. It was wonderful. We talked lots of politics, lots of analysis, lots of attempting to understand, gleaning whatever news we could get of the outside world. And uh, I think being able to sit back out of the hurly-burly and coming to pretty clear understanding 
of why South Africa is as it is, um, of what makes it tick, not just in terms of its politics or its economics or its society, but its political economy, its socio-political economy, of the effects of apartheid, of its effects on creating wealth for a small section of the population, of the massive deprivation of the majority. Not just that it's some psychological quirk of people of one color oppressing another, but uh, that served a very fundamental purpose in terms of accumulating wealth at the expense of others. How important for you in your early years in the party was the Soviet Union, the Soviet model, the, the beacon, if you like, of actual socialism? I think it was very important. I think that its ability to come out of the chaos of its own revolution, its own the, the wars of intervention, to emerge as a very powerful state, to have mobilized its people, to have industrialized, to have raised living standards very rapidly, um, I think was absolutely exciting as a, as a model. I think we tended to gloss over the authoritarianism and say, well, it was necessary. It was encircled. Uh, it had to defend itself. And I think we failed or turned a blind eye to the weaknesses that that would cause later. Um, do you think the party was too slow changing? Yes, I do think so. I think uh, I mentioned earlier Khrushchev's speech to that 20th Congress in which he was pointing to the weaknesses um, of a commandism, of the non-involvement of people. And I still believe in terms of the slogans where they said, all power to the Soviets, how did they end up with no power to the Soviets, meaning the ordinary people and their committees. Um, and uh, since in South Africa we say power to the people, I think it's a very fundamental lesson that we've got to learn from, that we must not bureaucratize everything. We must not uh, allow the ruling party, like the nationalist, Afrikaner nationalists today, to identify their party with the state itself. There has to be a separation. Um, there has to be room for ordinary people to play a role. And that's why I believe the, there is a need for a communist party today in South Africa. And in simple terms, we will end up quite soon. You're talking about the need for a